All right. So, um, hello, everybody. My name is Jim Verdon, and I'm on the BHA FuseNet management team with Jenny and several others. And today I'm going to talk to you about El Nino, what it is, and its implications for uh, food security around the world where FuseNet works. So a little science lesson up front. Um, El Nino is a, a naturally occurring uh, phenomenon in the equatorial Pacific Ocean involving both the ocean and the atmosphere. And you'll often hear people t talk about El Nino, but also um, ENSO, which is an acronym for El Nino Southern Oscillation. El Nino refers to the oceanic part of the phenomenon um, in, the, in terms of sea surface temperatures, and the Southern Oscillation refers to the atmospheric part of the phenomenon. And there are three phases of ENSO um, that we uh, refer to. ENSO neutral is sort of uh, the normal uh, condition. And this image that I have here for you is uh, kind of a block diagram. It's, it's a chunk of the Pacific Ocean um, with South America on the right and Australia down in the lower left corner and the equator going across the middle on the, on the surface there. Um, it also shows below the surface um, in blue and dark blue, um, cold water in dark blue and relatively warmer water in light blue. And the way things usually work is on the uh, west coast of South America, there's an upwelling of cool water from depth um, that reaches the surface and then moves to the west along the equator. And it, that coincides with the trade winds that blow from east to west. And consequently, we typically see somewhat cooler conditions in the eastern Pacific and warmer in the West, around Indonesia and New Guinea, that part of the world. And those warmer waters favor evaporation um, and convection, which means moist air rises. Um, and then as it rises, the water content condenses and you get rain. So that's a rainy part of the world. And then the cool ocean temperatures are where you have drier conditions. Well, with La Nina, that pattern is, is exaggerated. The cooler waters um, come up at an even greater rate, and you end up with the, a, a really um, significant area of cool ocean temperatures in the Eastern Pacific and <clears throat> warm in the West. And you can see um, on the diagram how the, the dark blue um, below the surface is much closer to the surface, representing that greater flow of, of uh, cold water. But when we get to El Nino, that's where things are, are um, completely different. And that flow is uh, breaks down. And the trade winds uh, are very much weakened uh, or even reverse. And so the Eastern Pacific, becomes warm all along the equator. And that changes the position of the area of convection and rainfall. And it's that atmospheric consequence that um, ripples through the whole climate system that leads to uh, a lot of the anomalies that make for problems um, for human livelihoods around the world. Now, no two El Nino events are the same. And oftentimes uh, they're distinguished in terms of their relative intensity. Uh, and the strength has to do with just how great those temperature departures from normal are. And in the examples we have here, the El Nino event in 97, 98 on the left, you can see that great uh, red um, area along the equatorial Pacific uh, representing a strong uh, El Nino, whereas the one in the center, the temperature uh, anomaly signature is much less, and then on the right is more of a moderate event. 
Uh, climate scientists also distinguish among El Nino events in terms of where that uh, temperature anomaly occurs, um, and they call that the flavor. So whether the uh, it's happening in the Eastern Pacific or the Central Pacific uh, makes a difference in terms of impacts around the world. And then next, um, I'll take a look at the um, forecast. Um, we're into a El Nino event right now. And this shows the forecast probabilities for being in an El Nino state uh, season by season going forward. And you can see that the odds of being in El Nino are very, very high. So it's, it's assured, it's in the 90% range all the way through until next March, May of uh, 2024. And Within that probability of being in El Nino, on this graph, we see the relative odds of being in strong, moderate, or weak. And clearly, that dark red shows you that the greatest odds are for us to have a strong El Nino, which is important for um, being ready for the impacts around the world. And this is what the models um, show us. Uh, we should be expecting in terms of that sea surface temperature pattern uh, with the El Nino for the months of October through December of, of this year. And I think you'll agree it's very reminiscent of that strong El Nino map that we saw for 1997-98. Another way of looking at the probabilities is through a bar chart of this type. Um, there's a bar, there are three different colored bars, each one refers to the probability of being in El Nino, which is red, or La Nina, which is blue, or Enso Neutral, which is gray. And you can see across the x-axis there, three-month seasons um, from 2023 on into 2025. And the red bars are very high, um, like we saw in the previous graph. But this one goes out even further and um, shows us that we are very likely to transition out of uh, the El Nino condition by uh, Northern Hemisphere summer of 2024. So in terms of precipitation impacts, this map here uh, is one that shows the characteristic patterns of uh, greater or lesser precipitation around the world uh, when you have an El Nino and the months during which those uh, changes occur. And some of the notable um, patterns there are in Latin America, in the Central America, Caribbean, Northern South America area. Um, there's a tendency for dry weather. Um, in Africa, in the Western part of Ethiopia, uh, excuse me, during the summer rains, the tendency is for dry, uh, as is the tendency during the growing season in Southern Africa from October through March. The Indian subcontinent and uh, Southeast Asia, Australia, likewise experience drier than usual weather during an El Nino event. This time around, however, the El Nino is coming along with um, an, a, a very elevated global temperature as context. This graph shows the annual warming cycle for the whole globe, averaged over the whole globe, um, for air temperature at two meters above the surface. And Pardon me. The dotted line shows you the average, historical average, and then the little gray lines are individual years that were used to calculate that average. The orange line shows you 2022, so that was a, a very much a warmer than usual year, but the black line is this year, and we're even warmer than uh, 2022. So that means if we have uh, drier than usual conditions, uh, droughts as a consequence of El Nino in certain parts of the world, 
they will be that much more punishing, uh, both for, uh, for soil moisture, for plants, crops, livestock, and humans. And here we see the maps for August through October of this year on the left, November through January of next year on the right, and the probabilities of air temperatures being above the 80th percentile, so in the top 20% of the historical record. And we can see that many of the places we care about for FuseNet are in the red and um, very likely to have those high air temperatures on top of um, changes in precipitation due to El Nino. On to crop yields and the impacts of El Nino there. <coughs> this um, slide uh, speaks to global um, crop yield um, historically when you have El Nino events. And the map on the right shows the, um, I just heard it. Does somebody need to say something? I heard a comment. Anyway. No, you're going to continue. I think a couple people have to jump off at the 30 minute mark, but go ahead. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> and so you see in the browns, the places where yields are suppressed and blue where the yields are improved. The box plots on the left are for the major grains of the world. And generally speaking, the uh, uh, El Nino shows for rice and for wheat um, and sorghum suppressed yields overall, while maize um, in certain places yields will be down, but that's compensated by improved yields elsewhere. So it's um, more in the middle. And then soybeans actually fare better. And taking a closer look at regional scale in Southeast Africa, we have, we have one of the strongest um, impacts. Uh, the chart on the right shows that the El Nino uh, case uh, very definitely shows uh, below average yields for maize in, in Southeastern Africa, in contrast with above average yields in uh, La Nina years. And then taking that apart, to the country level, we see that South Africa and Zimbabwe, um, and to some extent, uh, Mozambique as well, th these are the places where the uh, impacts um, are greatest. Uh, going on to Central America, again, this is a place where maize yields are suppressed during El Nino events, and in that uh, region, we see that the countries that have um, the strongest negative signal are uh, El Salvador, uh, Venezuela, and Guatemala. In terms of wheat yields, in uh, northern Africa, North Africa, um, yields are down with El Nino um, historically, um, and within the region, especially in Morocco and Algeria. While moving over to Central Asia, um, we see that yields for wheat generally do a little bit better. And that's definitely true in Afghanistan, uh, Pakistan, and Iran. Rice yields um, do uh, suffer um, as a consequence of El Nino, generally speaking. And uh, pr the producers um, most impacted historically have been India um, and Thailand. And already we're seeing uh, signs of uh, suppressed production of rice in those countries this year with India imposing uh, a rice export ban. Moving on then to acute food insecurity implications around the world uh, in the regions where FuseNet works in West Africa. The El Nino um, signal there is really not all that strong. And as a consequence, we're expecting near average harvests. And the uh, main reason driving um, poor production where it does occur has to do with conflict and reduced financial access to the inputs necessary. In East Africa, um, 
this is an interesting case because on top of El Nino, there's also a climate mode called the Indian Ocean Dipole at work. And when the Indian Ocean Dipole is in a positive phase, as it is presently and is forecast to continue to be, that works in concert with um, El Nino to enhance rainfall over the Eastern Horn of Africa. And we see that on the map here with a blue polygon over Somalia, Eastern Ethiopia, and neighboring areas. Um, the key takeaways uh, in East Africa are that in the Sudans, uh, rainfall has been broadly favorable and um, really climate is not uh, a problem. The key drivers there are um, conflict and disruption of, of market functions. In Ethiopia, the uh, June, July, August season um, that's just wrapping up is has been below average and we expect as a consequence a below average mayor harvest uh, with declines in livestock production. But going into the fall, um, the enhanced rainfall that you saw on the previous slide goes into effect and is expected to lead to above average crop harvest in the Eastern Horn and with favorable condi conditions for livestock reproduction. Um, there is though the risk of displacement and loss of cereal and cash crops as a consequence of flooding because uh, there can be, uh, and there has been in, in historical um, El Nino events such as 97, 98, uh, really catastrophic flooding. You know, in Southern Africa, um, the rainy season runs from October through March, right in the heart of the El Nino event. Um, the maps on the right show that the first half of the season the uh, impact is not so great, whereas in the heart of the season, December to March, uh, really critical for um, successful uh, maize growing, that the dry signal is especially strong. And so the takeaways there um, um, are given here on the right. Last year was a, a har uh, near average harvest. Uh, and so stocks are expected to last through approximately December. Um, we do though expect with the erratic rains coming, uh, reduced planted area and crop yields. Um, and as a consequence, uh, lower demand for agricultural labor and reduced income for poor households. Um, that means uh, the or the, the regular lean season in January through March will definitely be seeing rising assistance needs in the region. Um, and, as, and then as that dry period progresses, um, the 24 harvest looks to be well below average, um, which is typical of El Nino in Southern Africa. In Central America, um, typically we have below average rainfall during uh, El Nino years. Fortunately, in Central and Southern and Northern South America, irrigation can compensate for that in a significant way, but subsistence farmers um, will uh, be impacted since they don't have um, those mitigating resources and therefore um, assistance is likely to be necessary. And then finally in um, Afghanistan, where there's been uh, three years of drought in a row now, we do expect relief that the drought will finally break as a consequence of uh, above average precipitation that's characteristic of El Nino in that part of the world. So um, that's a quick run through slides. My special thanks uh, here to the preparers of the content from NOAA, the Climate Hazard Center, NASA Goddard, and the uh, FuseNet Early Warning Team.